Hi, my name is Melissa Tompkins, and I'm very excited today on my YouTube channel to be talking about fear-free practice. And I have Natalie Gruco and Jenneth Settler, who are going to be talking to me today about different things that they do every day in their hospitals and how it has made their lives easier, the pet's lives easier, as well as the clients uh, easier, maybe also happier too. So I'm very excited to welcome them to my channel. And so I'd love to introduce uh, Natalie. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, your hospital and what you do every day? Sure. Yes. Hi, I'm Natalie Gruco. I'm a certified veterinary practice manager. I'm also level three fear-free certified and elite as well. And my practice at in Fargo, North Dakota, um, we're, we have seven doctors and we're currently the only fear-free certified practice in the Dakotas, the first and only. Um, and so that um, got us some attention from Dr. Marty Becker himself, which was the coolest experience ever when he called, um, he called right after we passed our practice certification and, and talked to me personally and um, said he was really impressed with the way we implemented things and um, just the different things that we made it fun, like we have cat parking in our, um, in our lobby. And if you go to our website, ahcfargo.com, and we have a YouTube channel as well, and you can see some of the videos that we've made so you can get some ideas. Um, everything we've done has just been kind of do it yourself, um, you know, types of things that you can have a lot of fun with it. And I use canva.com a lot in my designing of different materials because you're gonna, you, there's not really a store of like, um, you know, cat parking signs or anything like that. So you can get creative and, and make those things. So yeah, a little bit about our clinic then. And um, oh, we see, we see exotics to mm -hmm. and avians. Um, so we have a lot of staff members that are getting their avian fear-free certification as well. And that's just been um, really, really cool to implement, you know, more advanced techniques in our hospital. Awesome. Awesome. Jenneth, why don't you tell us about yourself? Hey, um, I'm Jenneth. I'm a certified veterinary technician in the state of Colorado. Um, I work in an open concept emergency hospital, uh, veterinary emergency group. Um, we've been open for about a year and I'm actually one of the veterinary nursing development coordinators there. So I do some staff training and onboarding as well. Um, and since we're an open concept ER, um, uh, the pet owners aren't ever separated from their pets. Um, so we can do procedures with the pet owners involved. Um, the only restrictions being like we have uh, a little treated glass window over radiology. So you can, um, you can see into radiology. We have a window into surgery. Um, so those are the two places that pet owners want to be. Um, with their pets while things are happening. Um, I would love to. Oh, shit. Well, technical glitch. To give like, oral anxiolytics beforehand, we really have to rely on a lot of things. However, um, we do use food for, for things that um, we're not planning to sedate or that don't have uh, GI upset, and that works really well for us. So I had an internet glitch while you were talking, of course, even though I'm plugged in directly to my cable and router, it lost part of what you said. So I, I apologize, um, and I lost you. I got so distracted oh, no. by the fact that I lost you that I stopped. I don't even remember what you said. So um, you were talking about how you open concept and owners could watch, and then I sort of lost you after that. So I don't know if you if you if it's okay if you don't sure. want to have anything else to share. Um, but I do apologize, and hopefully the audience understands that technology does not always work as you want it to. So yeah, did you want me to repeat anything? If there's anything else you want to share. Um. Okay. That's pretty much it. Oh, um, I'm a uh, elite fear free certified um, and also low stress handling certified. Awesome. Awesome. So I'm sure most people know what fear free is. Uh, I have a concept for myself. I've attended a lot of talks from Dr. Marty Becker and I've watched a lot of videos and I'm eventually going to get fear free certified. I just haven't done it yet. 
Uh, but why don't you guys each tell me something that that you feel fear fear free means to you and what what how it's helping the pets, like what it is and what it means to you. So Natalie, you go first. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it's truly been life changing for us. Um, not just in the practice, um, you know, day to day, but just personally too. Um, it's just really opened my eyes to things. Um, my dog, I have a black lab and he's, um, he doesn't trust other dogs and, um, he does, he really values his personal space. And so, um, I've been able to bring my fear-free knowledge at home and, you know, help my husband understand <laughs> things like, you know, we'll see how wide his eyes are and his ears are back, you know, give him some space and, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's just been really, really cool to see pets that are scared when they come here, especially cats with using feel away, um, simple things like using feel away pheromones, um, and adaptal for dogs. It just, it, you can see it. You can just see it instantly almost that they're more relaxed. So that's been really fun to, to watch. Awesome. Jennifer, what about you? Oh man, I would say, uh, a lot of people don't understand fear free. So unless you really kind of have, have gotten close and like seeing what there is to it, it's a lot of like, well, you know, we just, we don't hold on to pets, I think is one of the big misconceptions. And I think it's actually, it's so much more complex than that. It's a, it's a heavily science-based um, curriculum. Um, we use things like uh, knowing species appropriate uh, handling and body language and approach and understanding where dogs are coming from. Um, so a lot of, so a lot of body language training, um, and then we use gentle control. So rather than just saying, oh, I'm just going to hang on to every dog the same way, evaluating that pet individually, evaluating what you're doing, and then just using some kind of gentle control. So you are safe. And when you decrease fear, um, staff members are safer as well. Um, and then we have a way to kind of quantify with our fear, anxiety, and stress scale, um, these kind of body language things that Natalie said, um, these wide eyes and, and body position. Um, and we can measure um, where pets are at when they walk in the door, where they're at for an exam, where they're at for an ale trim. And we can, we can actually lower these things. And it, that is really cool. And even if we can just keep them at the same place on the scale, that's an accomplishment because veterinary medicine is inherently stressful um, for I, anything medical is, is usually pretty stressful. So if we can keep them at the same place or decrease that fear, anxiety, and stress, then we've got a win. That's awesome. Uh, I know that once I started learning a little bit about it, I started paying more attention uh, to the animal's body language and what they were showing. And I don't work directly with animals hardly ever now as a management consultant and practice manager. But what I would notice is that if I was walking fast or if my hands were moving or there's just those basic things outside of all the cool stuff that Fear Free does, but I could see a difference when I would change my own body posture and I could see a fearful dog and tell my like technician, like, Hey, that dog's facial expression, like it, she doesn't like that you're flailing your arms or whatever they're doing. And I, I feel like that's such a basic step that a lot of times we forget in hospitals that I think with fear free, you're focusing on reducing that fear. So that's that first step in making it better. And I, I love, I love the concept. I love the whole use of it. And it just, to me, just even, even if hospitals can't go all the way, if they can take a little step towards recognizing like what that fear looks like, I think that's amazing that you guys do that and have that. Um, has anything for you been different in your career because you went fear free? So if either of you had any experiences of different opportunities or different things in your career because you decided to go fear free. You guys can share whenever. Yes, I would say amazing. Like my career has really taken off since becoming fear free certified um, with Dr. Becker reaching out. I've 
had opportunities to be on the Fear Free Speakers Bureau. Um, so I've talked at different conferences and have done different webinars. Um, you know, it's really catching on in the community too. Um, I've done, I've been, you know, um, talks at different universities and, and things like that. Um, and, and just the, the pride that you feel too. I mean, it's, it, it feels so good to be recognized as a leader in, um, in fear-free handling because people are seeking that out now. Clients, pet owners, they're, they're really, it's catching on and they're looking for it. Absolutely. What about you, Dennis? Um, I had a real uphill battle um, going with fear-free certification because it was not a popular idea when I was getting started. Um, and like I said, that, that kind of misconception about like how it's not as safe or it's really slow. Um, and, um, so I really had to stand out and stick to my commitments to say, like, I am not going to manhandle dogs anymore. I'm not going to scrub cats. Um, and as I started developing more of a tool set for replacing those, um, other techniques, um, it got a little bit easier and I've had several doctors and, and managers um, uh, that really support me now um, just in, you know, saying like, hey, I've got this scared cat. Like, I know that you're good with cats. I, I've got this dog that, that ingested a toxin and we really need to get this medication. Um, and they will seek me out to, to come and help handle those situations. And, um, that kind of an environmental awareness is really important. Um, being aware of, uh, what's the lighting like, what other animals in the, are in the area, what are the smells in the area and saying, is there something we can change about this? Um, I see a lot of times, um, pets getting backed into corners, um, and it's it, total um, unawareness. It, it's not something we would think about unless you've studied that and know um, that this this kennel door or this bookshelf over here make the pet feel trapped. And you can say, well, let's why don't we have the owner take a few steps this way and then we do it. And it works really well. Just simple things like that. That's amazing. I would have not thought of certain environmental factors like immobile objects. Uh, I could definitely see people and other pets, but it wouldn't have occurred to me that like a bookshelf could be something stressful. But I guess now that I think about it, I've, I've seen my own dogs react to things where they're like, oh, there's this big thing. And I, it just didn't even occur to me until now. So yeah, that's awesome. Uh, what did you guys have to deal with differently over this past year with COVID and all the restrictions or changes or things that you had to do differently. How was that for you guys with being fear free? How did that affect you? It was definitely, it was very challenging at first, you know, taking pets away from their owners is one of the things that we try to avoid as Jenneth was talking about, you know, um, at her practice and, um, just getting people and pets comfortable at the door. You know, we would take treats with us, a lot of times and just offer a treat like immediately um, at meeting them at the door um, and also making sure to open the doors slowly just simple things like that of um, just being more aware of how we're being perceived by the pet um, approaching them to the side is another good one that's um, you appear less threatening when you're approaching a pet to the side um, and then, of course, face masks. A lot of pets were, and still are, because we we still wear masks. Um, they're af more afraid; they can't see your whole face and things like that. So we use a lot of pheromones. We spray ourselves all of the time. You know, the top is usually where the feel away goes for cats, since you're normally holding kitties. And then we spray our legs with the dactyl. Um, <laughs> so just things like that. Just getting. Um, and also preparing the client for the visit to um, making sure that they understand um, that fear free visits start at home and making sure the animals are used to their carriers, making sure they have pheromones on hand to give or if we prescribe pre visit pharmaceuticals, making sure that they have 
um, that on board and keep road rage down to a minimum because <laughs> pets get scared when their owner is yelling at, you know, and loud music and stuff like that. So just making sure that people um, can start fear free at home. Yeah, that's important. I think those are some fantastic techniques. And um, I, the opening the door slowly one is really good because when we think about from our perspective, we're just, we, we've seen this door a million times and we go out it and it's no big deal. A lot of times for pets, what they see is big reflective picture windows. And then suddenly there's a person where there wasn't a person before. Um, so being able to understand kind of canine and feline visual acuity and vision is, is really important. Um, typically they'll have a, a lower visual acuity. So things are a lot more motion oriented versus detail oriented. So they see big color blocks where things change and a little bit fuzzier and then also less color. So they see bright blue and bright yellow. Um, so when I was picking out face mask, I would try to avoid um, a bright blue mask to contrast the color of my face because they just see, I don't know if it would come across as like a big glaring, you know, teeth showing kind of thing or, or what it was, but um, picking the color of my mask was important. Um, my hospital actually did something really cool during COVID. Um, so we have uh, picture windows in the front and um, we cleared all, uh, I wasn't there at the time, but um, we cleared all the furniture out of the front lobby and we would do exams on the other side of the picture window, which a lot of practice rooms were actually doing. So the pet owners could be right there and the pets could be right on the other side. Um, so they could still be involved and we felt like we could keep our staff safer. Um, the other thing is when we were doing curbside um, at my last practice um, with cats, I would spray a feel away towel, take it out, bring the cat inside, and then get my history so that they've had 10 minutes to adjust um, to that feel away. And their, the, you know, the car ride is a distant memory at that point, um, and that give them some time to be exposed to, to that, uh, that calming pheromone before bringing them in or before getting our exam started. Yeah, I think that's so important. I've done a lot of cat-friendly talks. Um, I'm, I'm a member of AFP, and I uh, used to work for a cat-friendly hospital. We were cat-only, so I've done a lot of that in telling people, like, have the cat come in and sit in the exam room for 10 or 15 minutes before the appointment, and it's, it is definitely better for them to do that, whether the mom can be there or not, because who knows with curbside, but I do feel like that's such a good implementation. I don't know. Do you feel like dogs have that same need or that same calming time or are they different? Or maybe it's individualized. I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think it would be a little bit different. A lot of dogs tend to be, um, they're used to leaving the house or used to going to different places. That depends. There are a lot of dogs um, we call pandemic puppies that didn't have access to as much socialization. Whereas cats, for the most part, um, we think of them as being in the house all the time. Um, so being in a car is very foreign and it usually results in going to the vet. Um, so yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think that dogs absolutely can benefit from that 10 minutes of being able to adjust um, before we get started whenever possible. Awesome. Uh, what do you guys think, um, as far as your use of Fear Free has been your biggest challenge? I know Jennifer mentioned a few things of people not accepting it, but what do you feel like has been your biggest challenge overall in doing Fear Free throughout COVID or not? I would say, I would agree with that. I mean, getting people on board, um, you know, we've been practicing Fear Free since 2017. Um, so the beginning parts were very, challenging. Um, we formed a fear-free committee to help with that. So we had um, somebody from each department on our committee, which really helped. Um, but especially the veterinarians, I think that was probably the most challenging part is just getting all of our veterinarians um, really on board and just truly understanding, you know, um, 
we don't have to do the vaccines today. You know, if the pet is that scared, we can, we can have the client come back. And, um, and now after, you know, being a fear-free certified practice and um, just, it's part of our culture now. So those challenges have really, we don't really have that anymore. Everybody understands what we need to do. That's awesome. Um, I think some of my challenges were, yeah, like kind of being a, a pioneer when it was, I mean, there are plenty of people that have been doing the stuff that Fear Free talks about for years and decades. And I think of those people as absolute sages. And um, I think they're amazing. As a movement, it's still relatively new. Like, um, like Natalie was saying, probably around 20. 17 uh, maybe a year or two before that um so educating other people on, on what it's about was a, a big deal and um there it is hard to function as an island while doing for free the more people that you can get on board and the more environmental awareness you can you can spread the easier it is for for everybody I um, attended a talk with Bayer and it's in a program uh, several years ago now, shortly after the Bayer Bracky study came out when they were talking about why you have to have more cat friendly and stuff. And they, someone at this, it wasn't a seminar, but whatever, at this conference, we'll call it, said that you need to have one person that's really comfortable with cats in your hospital. And I stood up in the room of like 150 people or whatever and I said, that's wrong you need to have every one of your team members be good with cats because that one person that's really good with cats doesn't work seven days a week, all the shifts. So it doesn't help you to only have one person. You need an entire team of people who are comfortable and understand cats. And of course, instantly I was labeled as the crazy cat lady, which I, I don't mind. I mean, I love cats. So nothing wrong with that. Yeah. No. <laughs> I was like, you guys are missing my point. How can you service a cat patient really well if you have people in your team that don't like them and you're not battling that a little bit. So I think when you said it's like as an island, same as kind of concept as fear free, you need to have a team of people that embrace all the different techniques and challenges and appreciation for the process or whatever. So I totally agree with that, that you can't be an island. You can have some people who are better at it than others or at different certification levels or whatever, but I don't think you can only be the only person. Uh, so what do the certification levels look like? Because I actually, I, I, don't, I haven't researched that part, so I don't really know about that. So you guys are both saying you're at different levels, I think. I think so. we're the same. Oh, you are the same. Okay. Okay. So, but what does that look like for other people? If they wanted to become fear-free, I know you can do it as a hospital or you can do it as an individual. You can also do the same thing for cat friendly too. But what does that look like? So to start out, um, there's a veterinary program um, and I believe there's a different program for like shelter professionals and, um, and I know there's, I think they're there's branching groomers. out to, to, yep, groomers and, and trainers and pet sitters now too. Mm -hmm. So that's super cool. And, um, so you get your level one first and then, um, Fear Free also provides a ton of different webinars that you can do um, to get your, your credits because you need to maintain at least um, four hours of CE every year um, for us as a Fear Free certified practice. Um, every single member needs to maintain their certification once when you pass your initial um, practice evaluation. So, um, and then you can do level two after a certain amount of time, and then you can do a level three and then, um, each one it, and I was really impressed with the way they really develop you going forward. Like it, I would, at first I wasn't sure what would level three be like, but it really is an advanced fear-free course of, um, you know, puppy socialization and, and just things like that. So. Oh, that's cool. So it's a series of webinars. Um, it's all web-based currently. Um, the, the first program was the veterinary program, which I think is nine hours of race accredited CE. Um, and that talks about the whole framework and the, the basic kind of tenets of, of fear-free. So it goes over the 
um, why does fear matter? Um, so Dr. Karen Overall said that fear is the, um, the most damn, let me see, I've got this written down. Um, let's see here. The most damaging emotion a social species can experience, it causes permanent damage to the brain. Um, so it talks about like, why does fear free matter? Why, why does any of this matter? Um, it talks about how to recognize body language and, and use the, the fear, anxiety, and stress scale. Um, it talks about gentle control, which is those, you know, using a collar hold and, you know, this sort of positioning um, as opposed to um, something less natural and more scary for the pet. It talks about the types of um, anti-anxiety medications a veterinarian can prescribe. Um, and I feel like, I, oh, and touch gradient. So touch gradient is the idea that um, you start by touching a less sensitive area of the pet and then move down to the more sensitive area rather than just, you know, grabbing a foot and trimming nails right away. Um, the, the following, the following series are, um, they have different focuses. I know, I think level three was talking about going beyond the vet clinic and talking about socialization, because really, if we start with socialization, we're going to get more fear-free vet care. And does everybody have to, everybody on the team have to be certified for the hospital to become fear-free certified? To become fear-free certified practice, um, you don't originally have to have every single person certified. They, um, there's different requirements like um, 50% plus one veterinarians mm -hmm. have to be certified. And then I believe it is at least 25% of the remaining staff and 100% of leadership have to have their certification in order to qualify for their practice certification. But once when you are, then um, during your renewals, then the entire team does have to be um, individually fear-free certified, except for the, you know, the new hires. I think it's 90 yeah. days if I remember okay. right. Yeah, that, that, that's kind of fair because then it doesn't make them do it all right at once. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and what, um, for any, I don't know if you'll have this information as well, Jenneth, but Natalie, what type of revenue difference do you feel like it's had for your hospital? And I, I don't, I know it's since been several years, so it's kind of hard to compare and contrast, but like, how do you feel like that's increased your profit? Basically. Oh my gosh. I think it's, Bottom you know, line. and it is, it is somewhat hard to measure because, you know, um, what is organic growth and what is just due to, you know, what's due to fear free. But I mean, we're each year we're, we're, we've had about a 10% increase over the previous year. Um, our workers comp claims have decreased by 60%. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's and, huge. Yes, absolutely. And um, I think a, a good indicator of it is looking at our Google reviews. Um, we have, it teeters between a 4.7 and a 4.8 rating. Um, so I don't know what it's at currently, but all of, so many of our five-star reviews have some part of fear-free undertones in it you know people aren't saying necessarily you know oh they're gentle control really you know but um <laughs> just you can tell that fear free is the basis of their of their reviews so i think that has been a good indicator oh, that's awesome jenneth do you have any experience with that i know you're you're not a manager at your hospital so i don't know if you see that or if you kind of just know what they tell you it's maybe yeah, I have not yet gotten to work in a, a fear-free certified practice. Oh, um, yeah, so individual. Okay. Yeah, so I'm just an individual certification. Um, so I don't really have any um, play on revenue, but I I love that that shows that the the workers' comp claims have gone down. Um, that species body language training is so important, and I think it really turns the myth of well, if you don't hold on to a pet, then you're putting people at risk. Like decreasing fear is a huge safety thing. And a huge thing that I preach um, is that you can make things safer by reducing fear, anxiety, and stress. Absolutely. And something else that I wanted to add with the, um, with the revenue piece is the productivity of our employees 
you know, um, the decreased turnover, you know, that is definitely satisfaction. Yes, that is definitely a, a huge, huge thing for us too. That's awesome. I know um, when you mentioned the workers' compost, because I was going to ask if that uh, one thing cat friendly is the same that many hospitals have said they have a decrease in injuries and cat bites because they're moving in a different way. They might not necessarily be working slower, but they're working differently. And that has increased their employees or their team members' ability to like work with the cats in a good way. And then they're not getting scratched or bit because the cat's not as stressed out. And so I think I'm so happy that you said that because I think any any leader's worst nightmare is a bad injury, whether you're in the vet field or any other field. And I think our field is usually bites and then obviously severe scratches. That's usually our number one. So if you're decreasing those bites, that's awesome. So mm-hmm. really happy. because that's an expense. Uh, and as far as, I mean, I know I've always loved my team members, but it costs us a lot more money when we've had more injuries. <laughs> so mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it's coming down to like, I don't want people to get injured because of them, but also because I don't want to pay more money because of it. So I, but I would never not have someone go to the hospital because I didn't want to pay money or anything like that. But <laughs> it's just the fact that they get injured less is amazing. So, uh, and is there anything, uh, any suggestions that you might want to give any other veterinary professionals who are watching this, if maybe they haven't done it yet, or maybe they're concerned because other people don't want to do it? Do you have any tips that you would give them in, if they really are interested in learning more and being able to do it? I mean, I would say just, just, dive in, you know, um, don't be afraid to communicate to everyone, um, how much better it is and people will catch on, you know, um, especially for managers out there, you know, um, recognizing your team that our, that are getting their certifications, you know, um, whether it's on social media or, um, just shout outs during, um, clinic meetings, um, you know, the benefits people, people who wants, who goes into veterinary medicine to hurt and scare pets, you know, and once when people see how much better it is and, and it's not hard, you know, it's just, it's just learning and, and education and, um, you know, it's, it's so worth it. Uh, yeah, so I would say one of the biggest misnomers uh, or misconceptions rather about fear free is it, there's not just a, a black and white like you're either fear free or you're not. There's a massive continuum from um, from using pheromones or um, or doing some very basic things to you know doing this cooperative care like we do sometimes with zoo animals like teaching elephants to put their feet up on a platform. Like if we can do that with wild animals, what is stopping us from doing it with domesticated animals? Um, So anyway, that's like a huge, you know, down the road thing. Um, But it's, it's very much a continuum. And if you can take little steps to get started, then that's all you really need to do. Um, And once people see it, they'll get started as well. Some more practical tips that I have are um, if you're in vet tech school or you're in veterinary school, the first year of fear free certification is complimentary from fearfreepets.com. So go to their website and drop down one of the menus and and apply that way. Um, You don't have to like do it right away. I think you probably get like a year to, to do the certification. Um, and that, that certification is good for one year from the time that you complete it. Um, and then also talk to your leadership, your practice leadership about, um, you know, even if you're not a student, see if your CE budget will cover it. If your CE budget doesn't cover it, talk to your management about, you know, what can I do to try and get the certification? And you're instantly going to see how much buy-in do they have? Because if they say, oh, that doesn't matter or that's not important, you know, you're going to have a harder time being able to do these things. Um, And if they're really supportive of it, then maybe that's a good indicator that, you know, people are going to be receptive and especially leadership can have a huge influence on, you know, the culture of of your vet practice um, to know whether you're in the right kind of place or not. I think that you said something and it may kind of hit me that why wouldn't you want to do something that makes the pet less fearful when they come in? Like, to me, it doesn't seem logical. Like, why 
why wouldn't you want to try something different that makes it less scary for them? And I think most professionals, if you ask them that, they they wouldn't, they'd have to answer the truth. Like they don't want to make it stressful. So I feel like that would be a good question to ask people. I do have two answers to that that I, I'm going to get on my soapbox. Um, Go, ahead. Go for it. Yeah. So number one, the fear-free journey for me was a huge unlearning thing. I had to unlearn how to scruff a cat. You can't just say, you know, right now we're going to stop scruffing cats. You have to be able to train yourself in, in other techniques. Um, I haven't scruffed a cat in several years because I have all these other techniques that I can use that are safer and less fear inducing. The other thing is there's a lot of not science-based information that we are fighting a battle against. Um, One of them is the the wolf hierarchy theory that has since been renounced um, where uh, someone observed a pack of uh, wolves and decided that there was this alpha um, and submissive relationship. And he was reading these body single signals out of context. And they were wolves that were in, out in the wild and applied them to domestic dogs. And so there's just a whole mishmash of misinformation that is widely popular. Um, We have some TV shows that there are some really good ones out there. Um, Like I, I do enjoy some things from, from Jackson galaxy. And there was, um, there was a dog one with a lady, um, a British lady, and I can't think of the name and she had some really good stuff, but then you have some other shows that were very misinformational and, and just really promoting some very dangerous stuff. Um, and we have to fight pop culture. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. They still have, how many times have you seen on TV that someone puts a bowl of milk out for a cat? <laughs> Cats are totally lactose intolerant. Like why would, but that's still something I've, I've seen even recently. And I was like, really? <laughs> like, so Yeah. That's, that's hilarious. Uh, is there any other tips or anything you guys would want um, the people watching to know about being fear free? Any other experiences you guys would want to share? Hmm. It's me or the dog. That's the, that's the name of the show. She actually had some oh, good stuff. Okay. I thought I was like, really? It's your, okay. I can see. <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess one of the things that we, um, in our community, there's not a whole lot of options for positive reinforcement trainers or positive um, reinforcement like boarding facilities. So I, I, that's a really important thing to help your clients find the right choices for that. Um, we had a, a black lab puppy that was in the other day that was really fearful and um, you know, only four months old and already really shy. And, and the, the pet owner was going to drop her off at one of those, you know, overnight training facilities and, um, our veterinarian fear free certified veterinarian, um, you know, gave her some education on, you know, why that's maybe not the right decision. So I think we have to be careful with that too. You know, you don't want to single out certain, you know, facilities and say, we do not recommend X and X facility. Um, but more of, you know, we don't recommend facilities that offer negative reinforcement or balanced type training. So I I think that is, um, a good tip too. Yeah. Finding those other services is, is a challenge and, and, you know, advocating for other parts of uh, pets wellness is, is important as well. Mm -hmm. And I think I can see those being challenging for people. And I like how you said you had to unlearn things because, Mm -hmm. you know, I I have unlearned things myself over the years of of learning more about these things. Uh, And I love the wolf concept too. It makes me laugh. I have a Chihuahua weenie dog and a Chihuahua terrier. Neither of them have anything related to a wolf. I mean, they're like 15 and 17 pounds. I think they're smaller than wolf puppies. So it makes me laugh when people are like, my dog's wolf thing. And I'm like, maybe if you have a Husky or German Shepherd, maybe, or Malinois or something that's a little closer. But even then, you know, they're not eating carcasses. So really that's your answer. So, 
Oh, all right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me. I appreciate your time. And I hopefully the audience will gain some great information about Fear Free. I will put all of the links that you guys mentioned in my description on the YouTube channel. So anybody watching, you'll be able to just click on it below. And uh, if you'd love to subscribe to my channel, then you'll get to see more videos. I'm going to do everything veterinary practice management or veterinary related. So I appreciate all of everyone's attention and time today. Thank you guys so much.